Parsing the panoptic fugue, the visuo-cognitive disambiguation of a figurative array drawn through a loop. The first item I will explain is the keystone that unites and supports an array of functional structures. This simple triangular prism is the primary form of the triple flat. Two tall rectangular holes stand gaping in its face. In the shadowy space behind each hole, a luminescent orb hovers eerily, creating the uncomfortable illusion that it is making eyes at us. Now let's look within these holes. The translucent outer skin of the luminescent disembodied orb ball encapsulates a smoky, pollutant-filled fluid, within which tethered sparks whiz around at fantastic speeds. These are barely held in check by springy, arched arms that absorb the surplus centrifugal energy and convey it inward towards the nucleus, which folds in thirds around a dark inner node. Let's take a closer look at these sparks. This is a detailed representation of one of the six mini-spark globules contained within the disembodied orb ball. This structure accelerates itself ever faster, generating energy that is converted to electromagnetic radiation. Clearly visible along the outside membrane of the sphere are the four primary vents, as well as the partially dilated backup vents. The lighter tone structure at the center is oriented so its main surfaces align with these vents. It is clearly the source of the luminescence, and careful observation reveals that it is also the source of the smoky pollutant. This topologically complex structure is called the valley fold activated surface. The nested rings and loopholes maximize surface area while retaining smoothness for clean energy flow. The outer layer forms a protective hood around the ring that is threaded through the inner space. The energies generated in the inner layer radiate out to the interior surface of the outside layer, which is speckled by beady nodules. These play a vital role in the orb ball's energy cycle. Let's zoom in on one of these nodules. It's called the Dynamo Crib Nanodome. The sturdy dome has openings in the front and behind. An illuminated ball is suspended from a thin fixture that juts out of one side of the dome. The whole structure is capped with a pointy chimney from which trails a hazy cloud of pollutant particles suspended in the surrounding humor. The little round Chinese lantern is powered by electric current and hung before a concave mirror to maximize its glow. Inside the Chinese lantern hangs a perpetuated flash plasma bulb. At first, it merely appears to be an unusually brilliant conventional bulb, but it is distinguished by the unique way it substitutes a magnetic suspension of excited plasma for a conventional filament. This is necessitated by the intense pressure waves that periodically pummel the valley fold activated surface. Unfortunately, if we try to look within the nanodome, we are confronted with steel bars through which issue a steady warm breeze. Although we would like to see into the interior, it is as ink black as the outside is bright, and due to the inherent dangers of a high voltage industrial environment, it would not be prudent to press further. This is a study of the motion of the humor surrounding the nanodome as seen from above. The world pattern of the humor at the bottom is a clear indication of the intake of fluid, whereas the unidirectional flame-like pattern at the top indicates effluent. The smoky plume of particulate matter billows from the center, riding different air currents. Now let's take a step backwards. As mentioned before, the orb ball is filled with fluid. The small valve on its surface is regulated by a barometer. When the internal pressure exceeds a certain level, the valve opens to discharge excess fluid into the surrounding environment. The cloud of hot vapor expands as it rises, and water condenses onto the suspended particulate matter. 
This discharge deserves a second look. Defying the laws of chaos apparent in the movement of fluids, the cloud manifests itself as an ordered structure for a flashing instant. This is called the queasy flowering tower. It's a strain to make an accurate description of its form from such a brief observation, but this schematic representation seems to come close. The cloud forms a balanced and stable tower founded on a row of seven bulging cloud tongues and stacked in five layers to form a triple crowned peak. A tripartite bit is enveloped within each tongue of cloud. The phenomenal order that is expressed in this formation originates from the influence of these bits. Parsing the panoptic fugue, the visuo-cognitive disambiguation of a figurative array drawn through a loop. Let's return to the queasy flowering tower and take a closer look at one of the individual bits. They are termed impurity clusters. It appears from this magnified view that the schematic representation was accurate as to their tripartite form. But we have yet to get to the bottom of this. Deprived of its masking sheath, we see that the impurity cluster is actually a trinity of dark balls. Next is a kind of inverted image, the long arm of the strong force. Without its captive particles, the field re-manifests itself as force lines curving out and around its empty sockets. These are invisible to the naked eye, but leave a faint trace on specially treated photographic film. Now, let's look closer at one of the three identical components of the impurity cluster. This is called the sealed iron nut. Well protected indeed are the contents hidden within. The upper and lower hemispheres of rust-pitted gray shell are fastened shut with industrial strength rivets. Were the seemingly impermeable layers cleaved apart, one would be surprised to see immediately below the surface a soft, foamy layer of insulating plush. Of course, when opening a package, the urge is to quickly get to what's inside. So in that spirit, if we were to slice away the insulation, we would find a barbed sphere suspended in the center of the sealed iron nut. This is called the cozy urchin. In order to more fully admire its harmonious form, let's remove it from its packaging. The gleaming silver spikes are set into sockets arranged in a regular geometric pattern around the otherwise featureless surface. At first glance, its threatening form seems to imply some dreadful military function, but it is surprisingly lightweight, and the finely wrought details have an almost decorative delicacy. The spikes appear quite immobile, but, as can be seen, they are easily unscrewed and removed. When the seal is broken, a slight exhalation issues forth from the socket holes. This suggests that these are in fact openings to an inner cavity. What would happen if we removed all of these spikes? In this state, the cozy urchin is known as the ravished urchin. A slightly viscous, Clear fluid runs down its sides and collects in a puddle below, giving off an odor of honey and peat. The inner cavity remains obscure. If, at this point, it were left alone for a fortnight, it would undergo a process of germination, and upon returning, we would find it thriving. In this resplendent state, the ravished urchin is known as the rallied urchin. Long stems and broad leaves protrude from the socket holes and shield a population of gnats and mites. The long stems reach upwards and bloom. Parsing the panoptic fugue, the visuo-cognitive disambiguation of a figurative array drawn through a loop. 
Now let's take a step backwards. We return to the keystone figure of the triple flat. In the belching form of the triple flat, the two unilluminated holes spew forth large clouds of oily black smoke. These murky masses are a threatening sign of the dangers of polluted sockets. If this situation were not promptly remedied, the result would certainly be the juiceless inferno form of the triple flat. A white-hot chemical fire rages out of control and radiates a desiccating heat, although the form of the triple flat remains whole, untarnished, and burnished pure. Let's look at another variant. This is the glass house form of the triple flat. Through boxy transparent walls, we see that the internal space is divided horizontally into two compartments, a large ancillary space below for the disembodied luminescent orb balls, and a much smaller principal compartment above that is separated from the ancillary space except for a small flue in the floor. If we re-examine this principal compartment, we see that the flue allows the particle-laden smoke to enter the upper space where it is processed and consumed, thus avoiding the ignition of the juiceless inferno. Centered directly over the flue, is a six-armed, star-shaped blob. When the principal compartment is forced open, the neutralization of the energy differentials between the inside and outside areas creates a burst of light. The light coagulates into a radial splash, and 18 droopy fingers spread out from a center with six plushy inbumps. This is called the Blastomere Discarded Body Glove. The light fades and reveals the six-arm blob within the principal compartment. In this view, we are looking up at the ventral or bottom side of the snow shape commandeering processor. It is suspended in the middle of the air by unseen forces and emits a sharp buzzing noise. The main body is composed of sections molded from a waxy-looking ivory synthetic that are precisely fitted together in a radial symmetric pattern. The tips of the arms have a dull gray metallic sheen. In the exact center of the central plate is a small, shallow, circular recess. Let's take a closer look at this recess. This feature is called the lower orifice of the processor. The name is misleading, though, because, like some primitive animals, the processor only has one orifice. Later, we shall see that this name derives from a historical misunderstanding of the processor's function. On one side of this recessed area is a simple fan that draws air in, next to what appears to be a sewage spout. Although the thin rivulet of water pouring from the spout is an unnatural shade of bright green, there are neither foul odors nor any disturbing signs of poison or contamination. Now, let's look more carefully at one of the processor's arms. Upon closer inspection, the gray outer layer is revealed to be a finely woven screen of metal and optical fibers. Removed, we can see that it protects an open-ended, translucent, glassy tube that is such a pure shade of cool white that it appears to be fluorescing. These tubes are called brilliants. They radiate a super-spectral wavelength of ultra-high frequency light that alters the molecular structure of certain organic compounds as they pass through the hollow bore. If stared at for too long, this light may cause retinal damage. But don't be alarmed. The harmful rays have been filtered out of this image. 
Now, please recall the ventral view of the processor. If the ventral plate and brilliance are removed, we can see the complicated internal machinery supported by a skirt of molded sections. In the center, a conduit leads to the so-called lower orifice. Nestled in the joints of the arms and main body is a ring of six conjoined bulbs that mostly obscure the dark space beyond. The ring is called the Metra Hex Headband. The surface of its rounded form is divided into two distinct areas. The rock-hard outer ends are firmly fixed in place, whereas the rest of the surface is plastic and slightly yielding to the touch. When viewed from below, the only other visible features are six fasteners. Let's look close up at one of the rounded bulbs as viewed from the opposite side. Here, we witness an individual metrahex head during a projectile impact test. The protective top end successfully deflects a bombardment of tiny particles that ricochet in an asterized pattern. In front, two gold-plated circular contacts convey signals from the nerve center of the snow-shaped commandeering processor to the internal systems of the metrahex head. The only other observable feature is a small tube protruding from the bottom. Although the upper surface appears completely impermeable, this close-up reveals that it is actually perforated with millions of tiny eyelets. These are called channel pumps. These holes can be seen more clearly under magnification. The curvy blocks that form the side of the tube come together in the lower half to form a kind of gate, currently closed. The antenna-like extensions on the external side act as sensors, opening the gate when they are properly stimulated. Thus, the channel pumps act as a kind of final filter for any particles that make their way through both the screens and brilliance located above. Now, let's return to the greater form of the Metra Hex head. In this cutaway view, we see that the walls house a bipartite inner cavity. The greater space lies within the well-protected upper section and the lesser space below. If we look closely, we see a tiny capillary near the base. Now, let's take a look within the greater cavity where lies the bilobulge a tec. The pill-shaped body is ribbed and folded to increase surface area. This maximizes the rate at which it is able to absorb the particles allowed through the channel pump. What is inside this structure remains a mystery, as the slightest disturbance causes the delicate sponge-like material to corrode with astonishing rapidity. Of course, the most obvious features are the two almost comical appendages that reach forward to connect with the gold-plated contacts. To see what lies within the minor cavity, we need to lift up the billow bulge. The apparatus revealed is called the comptroller lever. The lever's position is dictated by signals sent to the metrahex head. The signals are relayed through the upper appendages and processed within the billow bulge. The two posterior appendages turn the ball in its socket and adjust the angle of the lever. If we compare the relative position of the six levers found within the metrahex head, we see that they are always set at perpendicular angles. That is, they point in the x, negative x, y, negative y, z, and negative z axes of three-dimensional space. The air around the lever is highly charged. Be advised, it zaps anything that it touches with a static electric shock, although this does not appear to affect the billow bulge in any way, insulated as it is within the metrahex head. Parsing the panoptic fugue the visuo-cognitive disambiguation of a figurative array drawn through a loop. 
Now, let's take a step backwards. Please recall the complete view of the Metra hex headband. The fasteners run through this washer ring before they connect with the equipment in the core of the Snowshape commandeering processor. Mounted in the shadowy depths behind the Metra hex head and the washer ring is the discrete selector module. Although at first glance it may appear to be an intricately wired computer, closer inspection reveals that the circuitry is quite simple. There is more of the mechanical than electronic here. In fact, the intake and effluent pipes seen at the center run up from the lower orifice directly into the odd-shaped processing mechanism. Despite these mechanical works, it would not be entirely inaccurate to characterize it as a kind of primitive computer, as one of its functions is to generate and send electric signals to other components of the Snowshape commandeering processor. The wires that emerge from the processing mechanism run to three primary and three secondary points in line with the gold contact points on the Metra hex heads. The processing mechanism's housing is divided into a large central chamber and a smaller subsidiary chamber. The central chamber is called the cloakroom. Fluids gurgle and wish as they steadily circulate within. A wavering, almost melodic humming pervades the local environment, and, along with the acrid smell of ozone, evidences the electromechanical nature of the central works. We would like to take a closer look, but the hinged door of the cloakroom is sealed with a sturdy padlock that cuts short our investigation. This is a lateral view of the discrete selector module. We gain insight into the internal functions of the cloakroom by observing that it extends through to the upper surface where a number of ports connect it to the structures above. We will return to these ports in a few moments, but now let's take a closer look at the subsidiary chamber. The so-called free radical dissolution room emits a muffled grinding noise and is warm to the touch. In this cutaway view, a circular tank is situated at the center of the housing. Pipes and wires run from the cloakroom and junction with this tank. The large duct bifurcates just before it enters the front. The small pipe connects around the side, and the wires plug into the boxy form on the backside. Perhaps an explanation of the purpose and contents of each of these tubes would help elucidate the function of the discrete selector module. Inside, the largest duct has two separate passages. The air rushing into the tank on the right is almost opaque with concentrated black smoke. But on the left, the air rushes out in a cleansed and transparent state. It appears, therefore, that the tank acts as a kind of filter, eliminating a great portion of particulate matter. Thus, we see that the free radical dissolution room is a vital organ. Not only is it indispensable to the proper functioning of the snow shape commentary processor, but by neutralizing the smoky byproducts of the disembodied orb balls, it maintains a state of equilibrium throughout the triple flat, preventing it from degenerating into any of the dangerous forms mentioned earlier. However, if we were to assume that these were the only tasks the discrete selector module performed, we would be missing subtle yet essential details. As mentioned earlier, it is also a kind of primitive computer, and we shall soon see that it also serves as its own generator. Among the tubes that we examined earlier is a small pipe at the bottom left that draws fluid from the free radical dissolution room. This fluid has the color and consistency of pesto sauce. Although the electric wiring carries a current into the tank, there appears to be no liquid feed, so we can assume this liquid is produced inside the tank. 
At this juncture, we should also take the time to compare this pesto-type fluid to the effluent of the lower orifice. Both are non-toxic, green, and similar in quantity, although the similarities end here. The effluent is a much brighter shade of green, has a thinner consistency, and is virtually odorless, whereas the pesto-type fluid is gunky, and its heady, sweet smell is incongruent with the odors of ozone and electrolyzed metal found within the environment of the free radical dissolution room. We must assume, therefore, that the transmutation of this fluid is one of the functions of the mysteriously sealed cloakroom. Let's see how this dark green fluid is produced. Within the tank, the duct is curled into a doubled coil. The fluid drains out at the end of the duct's roundabout root. The boxy structure at the back is an electric distributor from which wires run, intermittently girdling the duct along the entire length of its curl. Inside the duct, these wires connect to thousands of tiny electronic processing units. The entire inside of the coil is known as the runny pepper. Runny because of the green fluid that can be seen dripping down its sides, and pepper may be short for salt and pepper due to the tinny pops that are so frequent as to fuzz together into white noise. Both the noises and the fluid appear to originate within the aforementioned processing units that are arranged evenly around ribbed sections of the tube. The fluid pours into the small canal below and flows towards the drain at the terminus of the coil. The processing units are known as nutcrack maggies. Let's zoom in. Looking like a satellite dish mounted on a pivoted base, this is a complex piece of equipment despite its minute size. The barrel neck of the Maggie is wrapped with a layer of copper wire that generates an attractive magnetic field. With its force focused by the dish, the electromagnet draws the black specks suspended in the air into the mouth of the unit. Whenever one goes in, there is a slight whirring sound followed immediately by a resounding pop. Then, a tiny amount of green fluid can be seen dripping from the funnel-like structure at bottom, and some irregular black debris clatters down the long arched slope towards the drainage canal. As you may have guessed, the black particles that the nutcrack maggies process are the same sealed iron nuts that we examined before. Now let's see how their outer shell is opened. The cracking apparatus is a rather delicate looking combination of plates, rods, motors, and wires. Its great effectiveness is more a result of precision than brute force. First, an electromagnet atop the cupped upper plate neatly captures the incoming metallic sphere. The motors mounted along the vertical axis then clamp together the upper and lower plates, securing the sphere between them. Next, the horizontal motors move the C-shaped series grinders snugly into place against the sides of the sphere, where, with a flash of sparks, they cut through the heads of the bolts, and the iron nut explosively pops open. This sudden burst of energy ruptures the cozy urchin, and so the fluids are uncorked. Finally, the motors return the plates to their original positions, the electromagnet switches off, and the iron shell, metallic jetsam, clear fluid, and green biological gunk drops down through the hole in the floor. This close-up of the pesto-type fluid reveals that it is composed entirely of liquefied iron nuts, which are the source of its particular color, consistency, and odor. 
Because of their minute size, the fluid has no problem sweeping the denser metallic pieces towards the cloakroom. Parsing the panoptic fugue, the visuo-cognitive disambiguation of a figurative array drawn through a loop. So far, the internal workings of the snow-shape commandeering processor have been explained in detail, from the so-called lower orifice to the nutcrack Maggie. But what lies above the discrete selector module is yet unknown. This is a lateral view of the snow-shape commandeering processor. The domed upper side is assembled from the same waxy-looking synthetic molded sections as the rest of the processor. The main part of the dome is called the burbled stack, and the smaller dome on top is called the crown. Let's start our explorations from the top. The crown is easily removed to reveal a small crater at the center of which is a bright red button. This is the reset button, used to restart the unit if the system freezes or if there is an internal processing error. When pressed, a hiss of air is released from within the processor, which is why it was historically called the upper orifice. However, this rush of air is only the evening of pressure between the hot internal environment and the general atmosphere. As this is a functionally meaningless expiration, the word orifice is not technically appropriate. Now, let's take a deeper look. The burbled stack is occupied by an industrial mechanical structure that is protected on all sides by a void area. In the central space, a five-layered stack is topped by a smaller cap. A small tube runs from the very bottom through the stack and cap and then back down the side. These tubes and two small fiber optic cables connect to the cloakroom on the top side of the discrete selector module. Let's focus now on the waterworks system inside. It is called the Chakra Superliquid Pump. Its purpose is to circulate fluid through the burbled stack. The fluid produced in the free radical dissolution room is quite thick and impure, yet the fluid flowing up into the chakra superliquid pump at first appears to be pure, clear water. How could this be? It must have been processed within the cloakroom. Although this liquid is clear, it is anything but pure, it consists of a very strong acid and tiny grains of iron. After the liquid enters the main shaft, it flows through a series of spirals. Turbulence causes a powerful exothermic reaction between the acid and the iron that boils the liquid and propels it through the system. When the liquid cycles back into the cloakroom, it has cooled off completely and returned to a deionized state. At the center of the spiral at top, we can make out a small circular structure. This is a simple valve. When the reset button is pressed, this valve closes, cutting off the circulation of fluids and driving the boiling acid back into the cloakroom from where it blows out through the lower orifice. Each of the five units in the stack is called a dish bed. Judging from the outermost surface, they are made of a layer of copper sandwiched between two layers of insulation. The two fiber optic cables run through this structure. If we remove the top layer, we see the radial symmetry of the inner disk-like structure, which is called 
the codicil. The fiber optic cables skirt the inner and outer edges of this copper disc and link to the ends of six oblong holes. Copper is used because of its high thermal conductivity, keeping what lies within the holes at a high temperature. The insulation also forms a complete seal around the codicil, maintaining a low pressure environment in order to limit oxidation of the copper. These six holes are known as pedal suspenders. A tiny, fragile pellet is balanced in the middle of this space. Small springs protect it from any disturbance by external vibrations. The fiber optic cables link the holes together in a series circuit. The pellet is known as the boob tube. The acronym B-O-O-O-O-B stands for Balanced, Ovoid, Opportunistic, Opposite Charge Occluding Barrier. This little pellet protects its contents from all external signals and influences, both physical and electromagnetic. The small slot in the surface opens only under very particular circumstances, in a process that combines molecular rearrangement with evolutionary growth. It is impossible to force open, as the inner contents would be in a useless and undeveloped state. Its closed state, shown here, is referred to as the koi orientation. Here, the boob tube is shown in the loudmouth orientation. The hole in the front has grown wider, but it is still only halfway open. Here, the boob tube is in the transmogrified orientation. It has completely opened, and long bars resembling rodent teeth have grown down into its mouth. The teeth are actually the framework for an array of vacuum tubes. Each of these tubes is called a ventricle. Let's look in greater detail. All operations of the numerous minute elements within are powered by the thermal energy running through the copper body of the codicil. The specific function of each individual element remains uncertain, but it is clear that each tube functions as both a simple broadcaster and complicated receiver. There are 12 ventricles in each boob tube, 6 tubes in each codicil, and 5 codicils in each stack for a total of 360 vacuum tubes, each broadcasting an interrelated series of codes. Each receives signals of various strengths and wavelengths from the other tubes in the array. When a tube receives a certain code, it is triggered to broadcast its own signal to the other tubes and to flash light through the optical fiber that connects to the discrete selector module. This unit processes this optical signal and sends an amplified electronic signal to the comptroller levers within the Metra hex headband. One last observation before we finish our examination of the snow shape commandeering processor. It can only be deduced that the energy required to acidify the fluid and indirectly power the ventricles, as well as to produce the electric signals, is generated from the metabolism of the biological matter found in the core of the iron nuts, and that this process takes place within the mysterious locked cloakroom. Parsing the panoptic fugue, the visuo-cognitive disambiguation of a figurative array drawn through a loop. Now, let's consider a different take on the central figure of the triple flat, which, although it cannot be seen here, is a central part of this structure. 
This is a simple diagram of the Qi Force Operational Assembly. CHI is an acronym for Controlled Hypersensitive Incorporeal Force. This is the force projected from the controller levers within the Snowshape Commandeering Processor. It serves as a sensory system, although it has no solid mass. The hexagonal asterisk shape at center represents the six comptroller levers and the direction in which the energy flows. The peripheral plug-in form of the triple flat is at the heart of the Qi Force Operational Assembly. On each side is a row of five Qi Force conductive pins. These pins connect the peripheral plug-in form to the three flux capitals. When all these pieces are assembled, they form the circular operational assembly. Each block keeps the immediate vicinity of the triple flat clear of obstruction or interference. In order to increase accuracy and efficiency, the chi field is guided and amplified by the contour lines that run in an arched pattern along the surface of each flux capital. These lines are called the chi parallel grooves because they run in the same direction that the field naturally flows. The minuscule sinusoidal pattern etched into each pathway encourages a simple harmonic chi field vibration, reducing deconstructive interference wave patterns and chi power loss. Note that the grooves remain cool to the touch despite the quantity of energy they channel, a testament to their great efficiency. When in close proximity to the pathways, a strange tingling sensation can be felt. Little is known about the effects of this phenomenon, although it is not considered harmful. Counterbalancing the conductive effect of the grooves is the chi perpendicular track that runs through the unseen portions of the operational assembly. It resembles a cloverleaf highway interchange and has a similar function, the transportation of charged particles from one flux capital to the next. As previously stated, the chi field naturally runs in the pattern etched into the flux capital. To move sideways through this field requires energy and a vehicle of exchange. However, the vehicles themselves remain invisible. This is a theoretical representation of a driver's side view from a vehicle running on the Qi perpendicular track. As stated previously, we have not directly observed how this track functions. It is theorized that the vehicles cannot be observed because the act of observation itself causes an unknown disruption to the system. Experiments show that when the chi perpendicular track is cut, the chi field becomes distorted and unstable, indicating that the chi charged vehicles that run between the flux capitals act as regulatory agents. Now, let's look at the larger picture. The curved form is called the platyhelminth, Greek for flatworm, although this nomenclature should not be taken literally. In actuality, the platyhelminth is a cyborg, or system composed of interdependent mechanical and biological parts. In this representation, special photographic film records the circulation of the chi force concentrated around the head area. The same type of photographic film is used to observe the so-called long arm of the strong force that bonds the three sealed iron nuts into impurity clusters. The two forces appear to be related. Both express themselves on the film as arched fields with six poles, although the fields around the platyhelminth appear less concentrated due to the vast difference in scale. Why does the chi force originate in the platyhelminth's head? This is a dissection view. 
If we cut into the frontal part of the curved area and peel back the outer layer, we discover a triangular cavity. The triple flat inhabits this space and is the origin of the emanating chi force. A system of vividly green vessels also originates here and branches off into the body. Let's take a more detailed look at the head of the platyhelminth. We clearly see eyes, a mouth, and what appear to be whiskers, feelers, or antennae. It would seem that little explanation is necessary, as the facial organs appear to have standard function and anatomy. Not so simple. Their appearance is only a clever illusion. Earlier, we mentioned that the platyhelminth should not be mistaken for its biological namesake. While some organs are functional, others are only trompe l'oeil fakes, such as the eyes and whiskery nose structure. The mouth of the platyhelminth is set in the almost comical down-curving arc typical of scavengers. The ring of large, nasty-looking teeth gives it a predatory appearance. However, the whole organ is completely fake, simply a pattern of pigment on the surface. Aside from its credible powers of intimidation, it is utterly functionless. It can be assumed that either the sensory and metabolic functions of the eyes, nose, and mouth are carried out by alternate structures, or that these functions are entirely lacking within the platyhelminth. This feeler, however, is entirely real and functional. It reaches well in front of the body and is sensitive to touch, pressure, position, temperature, and vibrations. In this close-up view, we see three minute fingers at the end, tingling with a concentration of sensitive nerve endings. This is the end of one of the smaller functional antennae. This strange organ is adapted to sense changes in the chi field around the head. The transparent, bubble-like tip contains an inert fluid and is vertically bisected by a thin membrane pierced in the middle by a small hole. A small globule suspended in the fluid periodically shoots through this hole. This globule has a strong chi charge and is either attracted or repelled by the chi force. In this way, the platyhelminth has a kind of sixth sense that we do not. Parsing the panoptic fugue, the visual cognitive disambiguation of a figurative array drawn through a loop. Let's go back to the larger form of the platyhelminth. This is called the fine, fancy, lovely, lacy, decorative doily, or fall dead. It is the outermost skeletal layer of the platyhelminth and provides support for the distinctive double curved body. Fourteen bulging nodes punctuate the exterior surface. We will soon learn more about the function of these nodes. But first, let's consider three different configurations of the internal connective structures that run between the 14 nodes of the fine, fancy, lovely, lacy decorative doily. This vertical hold configuration is the simplest connective structure possible. Each node is linked to the node directly opposite it along a horizontal axis, creating a series of vertical linking structures with curved tips. Such a basic shape hardly needs further explanation, though we should point out the somewhat faint equatorial line. The second two configurations of the fine, fancy, lovely, lacy decorative doily form a kind of pair. The first is called the O-heart configuration, named for the elliptical opening at center. 
the intricately wound connective structures join the nodes in a pattern different from that of the vertical hold configuration. In other words, the circuitry has been rewired. Eight nodes are joined by four curves with an elongated radial symmetry, while the six nodes at the polar ends are isolated. The second in the pair is the X-heart configuration, named for the distinctive pattern formed at the intersections of the connective structures. The linking circuitry is functionally the same as in the O-heart configuration. However, the connective structures do not display radial symmetry. The more aggressive curves form an ornate negative space. When any two configurations of the platyhelminth interact, they automatically perform a series of characteristic movements. The arabesque dance is pictured in a theoretical dance space. The black line represents the path of the X-heart and the white line the O-heart configuration. The two platyhelminths dance in accordance with their innate sense of movement. The swirling motion of this dance results from the different curve radii of the configurations as they perform a series of maneuvers in order to converge and emerge side by side at the top of this space. The labyrinthine dance is another set of paths. The black line again represents the X-heart but here the stripey line represents the vertical hold configuration. The perpendicular turns of one platyhelminth are driven into a boxy spiral by the complementary pirouettes of its partner. Finally, in the holding pattern dance, the stripey line again represents the vertical hold and the white line the O-heart configuration. The parallel pacing of the former resembles an airplane taxiing through a series of runways, while the curlicue of the latter resembles an airplane swooping through the air. These dances are inherent kinetic expressions that invisibly wait in potential within the form of the platyhelminth. The outcome of all three dances is that the two platyhelminths converge and exit from the top of the theoretical dance space. This climax embellishment tips the double knobbed convergence point and crowns their unity with a decorative burst. We have been able to observe how the configurations interact with each other in the theoretical dance space but we have yet to examine the physical space around the platyhelminth. Please recall the chi field that radiates from the head of the platyhelminth and flows through the space surrounding its body. During the dance, each platyhelminth senses its partner's field with its antennae. Again, chi stands for controlled, hypersensitive, and incorporeal. It is part of the sensory system of the platyhelminth. Being hypersensitive, the partner's fields are highly attuned to each other and interact in complex ways during the dynamic process of convergence. Since the chi field is incorporeal, it has no observable physical component. We can't see what the chi field looks like but we can observe the effects of its interaction. If we zoomed in on the space surrounding the platyhelminth's body, we would see the tropismas, the excited atomic particles through which the chi field moves. They should not be mistaken for the physical particles of the chi field. Rather, they are the smallest discernible units of the matter that makes up this space. Although based on experimental findings, this is a somewhat fanciful view. For example, the chi field is represented by short wavy lines, but we have no evidence the field actually takes on this appearance. 
We have seen as much of the chi field as it is possible to see, but as this is a sensory field, it cannot be inert. Sensation implies physical interaction with the environment. The effects of this interaction indicate the presence of the field. This is the rapture. When the chi field makes contact with the tropisma, it implodes with a tiny puff, and then both mysteriously disappear as though sucked into another world. All that remains are a few skimpy little castaway pieces. Now, let's return to the greater form of the fine, fancy, lovely, lacy decorative doily. We saw how the 14 nodes around the outer edge are connected in three configurations, but we have yet to examine the nodes themselves. As seen in the vertical hold configuration, each node terminates in a cluster of sensors known as the cuddle neck. Earlier, we examined the mouth, nose, and eyes of the platyhelminth and discovered they were decoys. The cuddle neck is the true sensory and metabolic organ. However, its mouth does not eat like our mouth, and its eyes do not see like our eyes. It consumes nourishment and sensation as though they were one and the same. In order to make sense of this complicated statement, let's look at some of the details of the cuddle neck. The two shallow canals that run up the sides of the post-like connective structure form perpendicular junctures with the canal that encircles the cuddle neck like a belt. At these junctures are circular indentations called canal pox. At the center of each of these is a grill that covers an opening into the interior. Let's remove this grill. This structure and the phenomenon that occurs inside it are called the flitions. Inside the well under the canal pox, a whirlpool of meteorotic sparks are sucked into a bent tunnel. It was stated that the cuddle neck is both a sensory and metabolic organ. Let's see how. The particles cast away by the tropismas during the rapture find their way into the flitions and form a burning twister as they are broken down and their energy is metabolized by the cuddle neck. Additionally, the cuddle neck senses the chi field by gauging the concentration and energy level of these castaway particles, as well as any patterns in the increase and decrease of these variables. Information about the particles is interpreted by the platyhelminth as a sensation. The cap at the end of each cuddle neck is called the tipper. Here, it has been removed from its receptacle. The slight bioelectrical energy from the simple coils is projected through the ring of miniature cilia. The cilia gauge the concentration of whole tropismas in the air. This is compared with the concentration of castaway particles taken into the flitions. Just as we would not be able to see white if there were no black, the cuddle neck would not be able to sense the significance of the particles gathered by the flitions if it could not contrast this with the tropismas sensed by the tipper. The parallels between our eyes and ears and the cuddle neck are limited, however. It does not have the same senses of vision or hearing that we do it perceives the world in a completely different and unknowable way. All of the sensory information and metabolic energy gathered in the flitions and tipper passes through the plus cube sense core found at the heart of the cuddle neck. The four cubes on the sides link to the four flitions the frontal cube to the tipper, and the rear cube to the back of the cuddle neck. 
the plus cube sense core electromagnetically processes this input and relays it to the rest of the platyhelminth. These signals exit the cuddle neck through a plug and cord called the tail out. The 14 cords in each fine fancy lovely lacy decorative doily run down to the equatorial line seen in the vertical hold configuration and connect to the deep interior of the platyhelminth. Parsing the panoptic fugue, the visual cognitive disambiguation of a figurative array drawn through a loop. We have seen the O heart configuration move through the arabesque and holding pattern dances, but we have yet to study the structural details that make it unique. The O heart reveals itself as a series of shells or layered spheres that derive from the elliptical negative space at the center of the connective structures. If we look within this space, we see a ball caught inside a wound-up spring. This is the vertiginous biosphere. The springy iridescent wires do not actually spin, but are tense and ticklish. They vibrate with a blurred rapidity in response to the slightest disturbance. The ball has the appearance of a miniature planet of thick black swamp mud that burps and bubbles as nauseating gas seeps from its rotten core. If plenty of water is poured through the O-heart, this foul muck is washed away to reveal what lies underneath. The residents of this dark place have shifting and uncertain forms. When cleaned off, we see the abomination called the Vile Beastie, also known as the Sludge Mutt. Its tentacles are normally long and snaky and writhe around under the mud, although in this image they are reflexively shriveled up. Its wrinkly skin is a pallid gray due to lack of exposure to light. It exists as a chassis for the bright sphere nestled within its body. If we pull this sphere out of the vile beastie, it soon peels itself open to reveal its horrid face. This is the Blooming Eye's fortune. It moves too fast for us to study in detail, so the strange organs within its misshapen body remain a mystery. Stubby, teardrop-tipped whips flail around as it foams at the mouth. This foam develops into lips, arms, and fingers that pull and suck into the toothy mouth. But this is all an illusion. The teeth are false and made of wax. Soon after it is removed from the vile beastie, the blooming eye's fortune melts away. For a brief moment after its anatomical parts fade, it takes on a different appearance. The ominous sphere that is revealed strongly resembles a black hole at the deep end of a powerful vortex, sucking all matter into virtual non-existence. At the core of the fleeting black hole is the arched hunger throne. Its blank surface resembles white porcelain and is featureless except for the gaping mouth. The teeth inside are worn down and appear dull and innocuous. However, they are bone-crushingly powerful. In this front dental view, we see through the yawning jaws directly into the gullet hole at the back of the throat. Silt deposited on the inner lining of the gullet has piled into four mounds and is now covered over with a carpet of lush grasses. This inside-out landscape is called the Ring Hill World. The symmetry of this domain may be due to the regularity of the tides and currents that run through it. Let's zoom in. A simple five-tiered step pyramid sits at the peak of the right side up hill. This is called the Empire's Cudgel. Its surface is dull anthracite, 
so pitch black that it almost appears to be a door cut into a lightless world. However, it is very hard and very real. Let's zoom in more. Coiled at the top of the pyramid is the serpentine wisecracker. Although a festive jester's collar rings its neck, today it does not seem to be in a good humor. After all, even though it occupies a position of power, it is all alone in an inside-out world. Let's zoom in all the way. It is not pleasant to observe, but today the serpentine wisecracker is not feeling well at all. It has a high tolerance for spicy or rancid foods, but something has so disgusted the serpentine wisecracker that it has been made sick. Let's take a step back to the essential spherical forms that we were examining a moment ago. As seen in the black hole, these face an onslaught of incoming material from the vertiginous biosphere. The C selector is distinguished by the lens gate set into its front. Numerous pellet-shaped missiles speed towards the gate in a disturbing and chaotic manner. However, inside the sphere, everything is focused and ordered. Nary a pellet is to be seen. If these missiles were allowed access into the interior of the sphere, they would gum up the works. The Empire's cudgel uses a variety of defensive tactics to prevent this. The gravity of the black hole tears the missiles into smithereens. The blooming eye's fortune bites, chews, and grinds them into bits. And, we shall later see, the sea selector uses the lens to filter them out. Given this massive response, we can only theorize that these missiles must be quite fearsome. It may therefore be surprising that the missiles take the form of this delectable treat, the perilous eclair. Although it zips along at high speed, it does not have the threatening military form we may have expected. Appearances can be deceiving. Danger hides within even the meekest of packages. Let's see what lies within the perilous eclair. In this cutaway view, we see a flaky crust filled with deliciously sweet cream and glazed with rich chocolatey frosting. Are we to believe that there is something sinister in this delicate dessert? Where the perilous eclairs attempt to breach the lens gate is a battleground. This is the no man's oculus. A ring of artillery defends against the incoming missiles. The steady roar of the guns and periodic sweet explosions reverberate across the great opening, nearly drowning out the sizzle of creamy filling on heated metal and the clatter of empty shells. The violent smells of nitre, ozone, and powdered sugar saturate the atmosphere. The air is lit with electric blue flashes and the glow of thick, sickly orange fire. Charred bits of crust and a mist of boiling chocolate rain down from above where long-armed droopy smoke ghosts catch the light, dissipate, and drift away. The defensive fire appears to originate along the rim. This is a fully automated rapid-fire blaster gun. It employs a computerized sighting device to locate and destroy the perilous eclairs, moving into firing position with surprising speed for such a heavy-duty machine. Its blazing barrel propels supersonic nuggets of destruction towards its doomed target. This is an eclair suffering a direct hit. The gooey pastry is simultaneously shredded by the high-velocity impact and consumed by searing flames from the inside out. Any detritus not instantly vaporized tumbles down to the floor of the no-man's oculus. The violent end of the pathetic, perilous eclair is shocking and demands explanation. Whose side should we be on? Parsing the panoptic fugue, the visuo-cognitive disambiguation of a figurative array drawn through a loop. Previously, we examined how the eclairs try to penetrate the defenses of the sea selector. What happens if they do get through? The fossil eyes, 
is another manifestation of the omnipresent spherical form at the core of the O-heart configuration. The slice of available space has been entirely filled by petrified eclairs, gumming up the works and arresting the O-heart. The pebbles within the fossilized are similar to those found in the sedimentary deposits that make up the Ring Hill world, although in this state the grass cannot grow and the serpent cannot be found. The pebbles seem quite dull, but they should be examined more closely. In the simple process known as panning, Water washes away impurities and common worthless stones, leaving denser, more valuable minerals at the bottom of the pan. Today, we have the good fortune to discover something glittering between the rocks. It is a gem. Extracted from its pent-up corner in the barren rock, it has been planted like a seed, buried in a moist and fertile environment that comforts its multifaceted sides. If, at this point, it were left alone for a fortnight, upon returning we would find the gem explosively expanding exponentially, thrusting itself upwards as if to launch up and away from the earth. The crystalline structure attracts the appropriate atomic elements from the nutrient-rich soil and perfectly replicates its molecular pattern billions of times to produce this dazzling treasure. But this is no ordinary gem. It pulsates with transformative power. It has rearranged its many facets into a shattering burst. Quivering with energy, it looks as though the gem wants to explode itself, to fly apart and reveal a center that is animated and lifelike, rather than cold, hard, and angular. In its enthusiasm, it recombines its thousand faces, again and again expressing the intrinsic upward thrust of its explosive crystalline growth. It comes to resemble a monumental skyscraper, a corporate mechanistic inhuman monstrosity, or a glorious exuberant expression of imagination and achievement. When the transmutation from lifeless mineral to embodied animation is complete, the result is the creation's head. The obeliskoid form recalls its origins within the upward thrust of the monumental skyscraper, while the shattering burst leaves its trace in the saw-toothed halo that crowns the body. The rounded surface buzzes as though the molecules were vibrating and scattering and zipping around with hyper-energized Brownian motion. Let's again consider the macroscopic view of the O-heart configuration, the interior of which we have been exploring. The sphere within this configuration has evolved from the inert, gummed-up fossil eyes form through the dazzling treasure and finally to the hyperanimated creation's head. Because of these internal changes, the platyhelminth is reincarnated as the hugging configuration. Within the now familiar curved form, the creation's head is found snuggled within two gently bowed arms. Unlike the O-heart, the hugging configuration does not have a negative space at its core. This is the life armor core, the mechanical assembly at the center of the hugging configuration that protects the essential element within and facilitates its use. Two caps protect four layers stacked like the stages of a booster rocket. Each of these stages has a unique form and function. As the assembly is easily taken apart, let's examine each stage individually. Directly under the removable top cap is the upper key assembly the 19 concentrically lain metal rods that emerge from the main body are worn at the ends by constant friction. On closer inspection, we see that they are easily depressed or played like the keys of a typewriter or valve stops of a trumpet, well oiled with a pleasing weight. Each stroke results in a deep shuddering movement from the stages below. The upper key assembly acts as an input terminal for the life armor core, 
but the method of input and the button pusher remain a mystery. Under the cap on the bottom side is the tumbler assembly. The rounded lower surface is made of a firm, porous substance that is infused with an iridescent golden fluid, although it is not dripping wet. In the center of the top surface, an access hole to the inner tank brims with the same fluid. Two cross-shaped structures stand like sentinels on either side of the hole. From each are suspended two rectangular metallic plates that are the same golden color as the fluid. The plates emit a constant ambient ring with an oscillating tone like that of an excited gong. The whole assembly could be described as a combination between a magic marker and a wind chime. Directly above the tumbler assembly is the main shaft assembly. At the bottom, a series of branching tubes drink up fluid from the tank below. At the top is a small square perforated by 19 gold-lined sockets. There is no entrance to the unremarkable cylinder, so it is difficult to determine its contents. But it strangely shifts about with a clunky whir, as though an irregular cog were gyring in obscurity. Between the main shaft and the upper key assembly is the dingleberry assembly. On the top surface we see the same square socket observed on the main shaft assembly. This conveys signals from the upper key assembly. An aperture at the front of the cylinder opens to the dark interior within which hangs the dingleberry. Although partially sheltered, this soft pink finger is always exposed to outside influence. The dingleberry is the focal point of the life armor core's function and the sensual core of the hugging configuration. To see what is meant by this, let's look at an extreme close-up. Caught within its bulging head is a light, wiry, angular metallic object. It looks as though it were designed for a very specific function, but its use value is a mystery. It has no moving parts, conducts no electric current, conveys no signals, and does not interact with any other parts of the dingleberry. Parsing the panoptic fugue, the visuo-cognitive disambiguation of a figurative array drawn through a loop. Having completed our investigation of the O-heart configuration, we now return to the form of its partner, the X-heart configuration, whose name derives from the X-shaped intersections between the connective structures that bound the ornately curved negative space at its core. This space is blockaded by a column of seven circles, a large one in the center, and six black and white ones at the top and bottom. This particular arrangement is called the opening combination. The circles escape the X-heart only after they arrange themselves in this particular pattern. They then fly into the free rain combination, a nebulous system of three planetoids revolving around a celestial body. Three long white shoots and three dark insubstantial loopy arms stretch outwards and weave the orbits into an interconnected web. When the circles are removed, the X-heart opens, revealing the dimension wedge. Like the screen of a detuned television set, the hexagonal center and arched wings are animated with dizzying lines. These appear to tunnel back like portals into some impossibly deep space. We will explore each of these three portals separately. The upper portal leads through a long hall with a vaulted gothic ceiling. The hall terminates in a wall with a sturdy door to the right, a kind of boxy utility to the left, and a triangular area above. The utility box to the left is a magnetic card swipe machine, evidently the key to opening the door. 
in the triangular area above is the simplified image of a book. We can only guess what lies beyond the door, as we do not have the key card needed for entry. But if we place our ear against it, we hear a vastness of silence, punctuated by the flickering snap of paper and the occasional giggling child being shushed. Since there is nothing more to observe, let's look down the other hall. The scene is identical except for one detail. The image above the door is a mug of beer. Again, the card swipe machine does not allow us through, but a stale smell, the sound of overly loud voices weaving through the din of a crowd, and the clink of glass colliding glass leaks out from behind the door. We now turn our attention to the portal in the center of the dimension wedge. The zebra stripe tunnel walls narrow down and terminate at a hexagonal floor divided into diamond shaped tri sections illuminated from below. As they blink off and on in glitzy disco dance style, the polygons appear to pop up and fold back into space, and seem to take the form of a simple three-dimensional cube. This is called the Magic Word Cube. The unfamiliar figure on the front surface resembles a cryptograph or a letter from an unknown foreign alphabet. Closer inspection reveals that the lines are in fact the edges of eight folded strips that lie across each other. No security system protects the magic word cube. It opens for us. When the four leathery outer flaps are peeled back, the opening process is half complete, but the cube remains sealed. When the four more delicate and yielding inner flaps are peeled back, the cube is fully opened. A brilliant blue-white light shines from the center, flares for a few short seconds like an electric plasma arc, and abruptly disappears with a loud snap. Parsing the panoptic fugue, the visuo-cognitive disambiguation of a figurative array drawn through a loop. We have been investigating the interior of the X-Heart configuration. After the flares that shone from the opening of the magic word cube have disappeared, the lucid ectoplasmic newborn crooks is visible. Its spookily translucent skin glows a dull red as though superheated by the powerful light. The main body is divided by a soft furrow that dips as it crosses the central face. Four chubby arms bulge out of the main body. In the crooks of these arms, round pores jet out thin warm vapor. These pores must be the origin of the brilliant flares. The crooks soon cools and becomes firmer. As the skin tightens, the furrow in the center is pulled open to reveal a dark target area centered in an elongated curve and hooded with a whiskered fringe. It has transformed into the ICU crooks. Inside the dark target area is a miniature replica of the greater crooks form. It is the Ziggy Keyhole Crooks. The angular network of slots in the middle requires a highly sophisticated key. We have been locked out of other doors, but in our previous investigations, we have encountered the means to unlock the crooks. The crooked jabber found within the dingleberry assembly is a perfect fit. It slips into the keyhole, grasps the slotted teeth, turns the bore, and frees the lock. This gives us access to the interior and the structures that lie beyond. The first of these structures is the psychedelic wicker wand, the fringed center of the ICU crooks folds back, reflecting and reduplicating itself into the widening interior space. This forms the main head, behind which a rounded, split-tipped protrusion juts back. This appendage is a constant feature of a number of forms. 
The skeletal structure and internal organs of the crooks are now visible. This is the bush and keeper crooks. The central ring is called the keeper because it lines the bony hole where the psychedelic wickawand is nested. A thin layer of loose, pliant, gauzy tissue covers the immobile arm bones and wraps around the outside of the keeper. In the crooks and inside the keeper, this material folds into feathery ruffles that slowly swell and subside in rhythm with the circulating fluids within. Behind the bones of the bush and keeper crooks is the feed bunch crooks frame. Fluids flow from the arterial channels through the ruffles in the crooks. The abbreviated channels at the center lead to the ruffles in the keeper. The ruffles are folded in order to increase surface area to facilitate fluid exchange, irrigating the crooks system. We have seen the skeletal and circulatory systems of the crooks, and now we shall look at the nervous system. This is the three-plug set, named for the shape of the connector pieces at the end of each wiry arm. These pieces each convey signals to the ruffles via a quartet of live electrodes. The signals regulate the circulatory system, control the unfolding of the psychedelic wicker wand, and release a massive amount of energy when the magic cube is opened. The stripy tube above wraps around the rounded protrusion like a sock. The three-plug set works in tandem with the H-plug set. Again named after the shape of the connector pieces, this much smaller set fits into the rectangular socket seen on the trunk of the three-plug set. It spans the ruffles inside the keeper and the outer surface of the psychedelic wicker wand, detecting tiny energy differentials between the two surfaces. Usually, it functions like a thermostat, signaling for the three-plug set to increase or decrease the amount of circulating fluid. But, when the magic word cube opens, it detects the reversal of electrostatic charges and triggers the three-plug set to ignite the brilliant flares. It continually conveys information about the condition of the crooks back to the rounded protrusion. The unlocking of the Ziggy keyhole not only makes it possible for us to examine the internal organs of the crooks, but also reveals the interior architecture of the magic word cube. The cube yawns open at the bottom to accommodate the crooks. The dark form of the psychedelic wicker wand runs upward into the cube. The white biomorphic form that fits within the cube is the curviform chassis. Below the large round head, two globular extensions wrap around the protrusion. The curviform chassis is the housing for the somewhat awkward looking bulbous cha cha. The top heavy structure balances on two lobes that are soft and springy and which insulate and cushion the upper pieces. The circular washer located at the joint between the two lobes holds the rounded protrusion of the psychedelic wicker wand in place. An inflexible scallop edged white layer sheathes the main trunk section, keeping the soft parts from losing their shape. The ball of the head is perched on a nest-like dimple at the top of the main trunk. Here, the bulbous cha-cha is in the so-called Pollyanna position. The lower lobes have been removed to expose the two black frond-like appendages that carry the structure's weight. These silently curl up or unwind in order to keep the main trunk perfectly perpendicular. With the main globe removed, we see the precariousness of its position atop the main trunk. The embodied swish form supports the psychedelic wicker wand and acts as a platform for the interaction of the crooks and the bulbous cha-cha. The Ziggy Keyhole Crooks nests within the semicircular socket at the bottom, 
locking the wand into place. We now see that the split-tipped protrusion contains a simple rounded rod. This rod is the leading luxury. The only visible feature is a long line running up the body. Its overall shape is very similar to that of the rod found within the heart of the hugging configuration. You will recall that the crooked jabber found at the heart of the life armor core unlocks the Ziggy keyhole crooks. It now becomes apparent that the creation's head and leading luxury are two manifestations of the same form. To reveal its core, the luxury undergoes a process of metamorphosis. The second stage is the lemon luxury. The tail ends loosen to create a bulge of slack in the main shaft around the central line. The third stage is the impact luxury. One side is sucked inwards, creating a deep cavity. This stretches and distorts the central line, creating two humps on either side of the cavity. The circular hole revealed at the heart of the luxury corresponds to the hole in the dingleberry assembly of the life armor core. The fourth stage is the harmonic luxury. The central line has spread open at the ends, and material from within the main body has popped through to turn the humps inside out, exposing the dark inner surface. Having compacted itself down, the entire luxury has now become tense and pressurized. This pressure causes the luxury to collapse inward and roll itself through the central hole, revealing the fifth stage, the thrust flower luxury, which is a semicircular tube. At the center of the leading edge, two rows of spread fingers line the opening through which the luxury collapsed. Parsing the panoptic fugue, the visuo-cognitive disambiguation of a figurative array drawn through a loop. Previously, we witnessed the metamorphosis of the luxury found within the rounded protrusion. Now, let's look at how the final stage, the thrust flower luxury, interacts with the bulbous cha-cha. The gangly reacher runs from the nest-like dimple at the top of the cha-cha down to the two lower lobes. It is anchored to the eye holes on the inside of the black appendages. A small bump descends from the top of the inner space. Here, the gangly reacher connects to the thrust flower luxury. Let's take a closer look at the coupling mechanism within this bump. Partially hidden under the main body of the gangly reacher is the wrinkle socket. In this uptight state, its ribbed sheath is stretched tight over the speckled node at its center. This node is called the sensorial snap. When coaxed free of the wrinkle socket, we see that it is currently shut. The pointed pod on top is enclosed by two stiff shield arms. We can only see a sliver of the bright interior from which comes a bright silver tinkling sound. This indicates that the sensorial snap is fully charged. The exposed node at the bottom is encircled with tiny sensors sensitive to the thrust flower luxury's fingers. The sensors trigger the node only when the entire cha-cha is perfectly balanced in a vertical position and free from any disturbance. Otherwise, precise contact cannot be established. When the thrust flower fingers meet the sensors, the arms of the sensorial snap come flying open. The wriggling sparks escaping up into the wrinkle socket are known as silverfish. They shine the same brilliant blue-white as the light we saw as the magic word cube opened. The little silver nugget inside the emptied space was the source of the tinkling sound, 
but it is now dormant. When the sensorial snap releases its energy, it drops down and leaves an empty space. The wrinkle socket is now in the relaxed state. The casing has lost its tension and slumped down over the empty socket. Within the relaxed wrinkle socket is the benevolent approach. It runs up to the nesting dimple on the top of the bulbous cha-cha's main trunk, where it connects to the main globe above. The segmented walls are moist and sensitive to pressure. When the walls expand, air is drawn in and absorbs moisture. When the walls contract, humid air is pumped up into the main globe. Although the benevolent approach is flexible, it is robust enough that the energetic silverfish do it no harm. The vast interior of the main globe is known as the inner world. The towering tank in the center absorbs the silverfish energy, which it then stores in the two round discs mounted on either side. The central lids of these discs are closed, but the outer rings shine warming rays through the humid air. Water vapor rises towards the cool upper layer and condenses into little puffy clouds that skirt the globe. A closer look at these clouds will reveal that all is not as it seems. This contraption is a cumulo sparkle duster. While the gaseous puff above is ordinary water vapor, it is bound by some strange power to a mechanical platform below. What at first glance appear to be snowflakes fall from machined holes at the bottom of this platform. These glitter with a most unsnowflake-like rainbow light and do not melt, even in the warm air. They have a strange tingly texture, as though some kind of enzymatic reaction were taking place on their crystalline surface. They drift down and inwards to the tank at the center, as if the inner world had its own gravity. What lies within this tank? Beneath the outer shell is the death's head casing a large, simplified replica of a skull of indeterminate species, probably mammalian. The empty eye sockets leer out at the discs mounted on the side of the tank, and its toothless mouth lurks over the benevolent approach. The puzzle-like cranial plates come apart at the seams and swing outwards on hinges, to reveal the hollow inner recesses of the skull, within which is found the tenacious teardrop. Little more than wiry outlines, it is difficult to discern exactly what it is. The insect arms, or antlers, that extend out and downwards seem somehow insidious or predaceous, and are those eyes, and a raptor's beak, or just a suggestive pattern of crossing lines? Let's take a closer look at the inverted drop shape at the center of the death's head casing. When the thrust flower luxury meets the fully charged sensorial snap under auspicious conditions, and releases energy into the benevolent approach, and the three plug senses that the electrostatic energies of the psychedelic wicker wand and the bush and keeper crux are balanced, and the atmosphere of the inner world has been saturated with enzymatic snow from the cumulo sparkle dusters, then the tenacious teardrop performs its function. This is called the deepest squirt. The silverfish energy catalyzes an explosive reaction between the enzymatic snow and the moisture in the air. The slits in the round discs on the side of the tank open to release a flood of hot juices that erupt out of the tank, drench the inner world, 
pour down through the benevolent approach and circulate throughout the entire crook's system. At the very center of the system is the reactor core of the deepest squirt. This is called the impulse generator. The four arms of the tenacious teardrop channel energy inwards and connect to the two heavy-duty generator walls. Outside of these, a spongy layer sucks moist air in and extracts the water needed for the reaction. On either side, facing the round disks on the side of the tank, are nozzles that direct the fluid outwards. Within the central chamber of the impulse generator is found a shiny snowball of the highly reactive enzymatic snowflakes. When it is pulled apart, we find nothing inside but more frozen white powdery crystals. Parsing the panoptic fugue, the visuo-cognitive disambiguation of a figurative array drawn through a loop.